to the door is a normal placement. Tattoos on my arm and up on my face. Hey guys, we're back with episode two of Tattooed with Children. This is your host for the night. My name's Ben Harbuck, and I'm here with Mike Payne. How's it going? It's going pretty well. Uh, I actually don't know if I enjoy recording at night because I thought I would because generally I'm on fire at night, uh, but this was a particularly rough day and kind of a rough week, so I'm kind of not on fire, as they say. Yeah, I've been kind of feeling that same thing all night. Um, It's been a weird time, but... I think I want to jump in. Uh, we're not sure where Flavor Ray is. Uh, sending a big shout out to him, uh, hoping he's not home in bed or with his lady. Um, Ray's gone for like one episode, and this becomes the ladies' man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got your bo- we have a bunch of bottles out back. We can just be taking shots while we're doing this. Uh. Okay, so the interesting, really interesting jumping into this podcast and just making a podcast. A lot of people I know have a lot more planned out uh, than we do, but that's not how we really do things in the Hidden Village. We don't have a plan. We kind of just jump in. And uh, I have a really bad history of starting businesses around things I want to learn, which is really not smart, but I do it anyway. So we've just kind of jumped into this. So so I don't know. I thought today what we might do is jump straight into why we're doing a podcast at all. Um, I'm I'm fine kind of going first here. Um, I we've talked about I've talked about doing a podcast. I know a lot of people I know have talked about doing a podcast. The, my thought process, though, was that it's just at the right time. Um, I'm learning a whole lot about myself that I did not expect to learn at 40. And the, the frustrating thing kind of for me about creating a podcast was what's the narrative going to be? Because I think that, hey... Hang on, we're going to pause for a 15-second break as Flavor Ray is in the house. My name ain't Mikey, but yeah, uh, I rock. You know why? Because I don't give a fuck. That's why it doesn't matter whether I'm cool or not. Just the taste of the word gives me the gut rock. It's not pop, just stop like a blood clot. Because we're here to blow up. So this is something a human being said on Twitter. Being fat is a choice. Being poor is a choice. Being depressed is a choice. Elite males will take control of every possible aspect of their life. Pussies will get fucked and cry. Your choice. I respond with, that is absolutely the weakest, most beta male fucked by cuck bullshit I've ever heard in my entire life. (laughs) See, this think is about how we should start every single podcast think, episode. Think about this for a second. Flavor Ray This motherfucker tweets. literally, this motherfucker literally is so weak and cowardly that he has to attempt the impossible to feel elite in his life. If he can't do what no man can do, then he apparently isn't an elite male. This motherfucker has not had pussy since pussy had him. And he wants to talk about elite males? All right, guys. Flavor Ray's here uh, at the uh, Tattoo with Children uh, podcast. Uh, I start every uh, podcast here. Apparently, I talk about execution of pussy. This is what I do. Uh, I will now be occupying the uh, uh, seat B. I think uh, <laughs> I, I, I think we were headed in a really good direction before you got here. And uh, all right, it, let's go with yeah, that. Wait, it kind of got it kind of got fucked sideways, but. Uh, okay, so That's yeah, we here. we're Let's just go we're with that, we're back with we're 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 back, and uh, I think we were discussing about uh, something. We were saying some words. See, if you can't remember what you were talking about, then we yeah. can. I I, I got plenty of shit. Okay, okay. well, well I understand, understand that. Good. Okay, oh yeah, we were talking about why we have a podcast. Oh yeah, that's the, oh we there is a reason for it. Right, there is a reason, and we hadn't really gotten to that yet. Uh, 
I don't know what who who wants to go. Let's, well, uh, I'm not sure where you were on it. Uh, to, to me, the story of this podcast is is pretty much the uh, the story of the. It begins like the, the moment you and I met, me and you, Ben and Ben and a and a flavor right here. Okay. We uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, Ben is the owner of Black Spot Tattoo, but before that, he was the manager. Before eventually became the owner of Standpipe, but before that, he was the manager of Standpipe. And uh, it was in Nakpasi that I met him. And I went into the coffee shop. It was, a, it was a, lo- a local coffee shop here in Lufkin, Texas. I hadn't seen that in quite some time. And I hadn't been in Lufkin for quite some time. And I'd only been back for two years. And so I came in there with my wife and my uh, daughter, who was then, uh, I want to say, three. And Ben's daughter was four or five. Yeah, we could say that. And uh, they were having a, uh, it was an event. The place was full. It was packed out. And I noticed my classmate uh, slinging drinks behind the bar. And I thought that was kind of weird. So I go up to her and say, hey, aren't you this person that I know? And she's like, yeah, aren't you the person I know? I say, yeah, that is exactly who I am. She says, yeah, my husband's the manager here. I say, cool, where is he? And Ben is sitting down having a coffee. The place is full, jumping, and he's sitting down having a coffee. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that white dude over there? All right, he looks kind of fucked up. Let's go talk. And uh, my daughter goes over and sits down uh, in a chair across from Ben's daughter. And so I sit down, and we, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm Ben. I'm Ray. And uh, we're just sitting there chatting, and he has a thousand mi- miles stare on his face, which makes sense. He's manager of his coffee shop. He's getting his ass kicked. And all of a sudden, look over, and I see that my daughter has left her seat and gone on behind his daughter and put her in a headlock. <laughs> <laughs> and so I go, oh, shit, uh, Ben, my daughter has a daughter in a headlock. And Ben goes, yeah. And I go, well, uh, do, you want, do you want me to do something about that? Or should we go over and try something? He goes, no, they're fine. I go, I don't, I'm looking at my daughter's, like, I gotta be totally honest with you. It. At this point, you seemed very concerned. I just met you, and we were getting along pretty well. Yeah. But you seemed very concerned that I look in their general direction, and and I refused to do that because I, I'm pretty sure what you were saying to me was true. I mean, I I believe that of all people, generally until proven otherwise, that right. they're telling me the truth. And and you really wanted me to look, and I remember very intentionally not looking. Yes, yes, I remember that too. Okay, uh, right. It's like your your back was your back's to the action, and so I'm describing it to him. Ben said, "No, my daughter has like she has like her underhook in, right? And she's going to like lock it in, and I think she might actually choke your daughter out, right? And I remember saying it'll be fine. Yeah, your your exact words were, uh, "She'll either die or fight back. One of the two. Would you like any? Would you like another drink?" And I knew instantaneously I'd found somebody that I'd been looking for for a long time. Because I've always thought of myself as being one of the witnesses in Revelation that, that uh, is assisting the destruction of humanity. And I just never found the other witness before. And immediately I thought, this guy is the second witness. And in which case, the world's fucked, but let's do this. That makes me very uncomfortable. And but. that that that's absolutely how the podcast began in my mind. I start I started the podcast going forward from that moment. I can see that. I can see that. The uh, the interesting thing about that story is it brings up how I met Mike Payne. Um, this is so this is several, like the best story he has. Several years before, yeah. And I don't. The the funny thing is, I never tell it correctly, but. Uh, several years before that, I had lost, the economy just went down a hole in 2007, and I had to find new work. I had had a career for 10 years, and it doesn't matter, and it just ended instantaneously. And so I was, at the time, painting houses uh, from like 7 a.m. in the morning until noon, and then at noon I'd come home and take a shower, and I would go to uh, Starbucks and work, you know, like 12 to or 1 to or 3 to midnight or whatever. And uh, and so I'm sitting out there one evening on my off day, working, you know, with my wife, and I, I don't remember if our kids were there or not. Were our kids no, there? I think the first time 
I think the first time actually you came up originally, like on your own, of course, your wife came a little bit later. She always okay. comes later okay. than you. Okay, right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> your wife always comes after you. Uh, see, um. <laughs> that's, that's not even remotely true. But so anyway, we're sitting there and we're trying to have a conversation, a husband and wife trying to have a conversation on the patio at Starbucks. This is, by the way, one of the reasons I started my own coffee shop. Uh, and, and this dude is loud as fuck, like over to the, like, a two tables over and like I can't remember if he was talking on the phone or talking to somebody else or whatever it is but essentially <coughs> excuse me We're essentially, smokers, guys. We're essentially what happens is at one point you know I, I, I say something to him about how loud he's being and I'm like listen you know could you could you bring your tone down you know right and he and he's like you know could you could you you know, just lower your volume a little. And he's like, hey, I'm sorry. You know, I'm not an asshole. I'm just from New Jersey. <laughs> and, I, and, and I literally look back and go, no, you're actually an asshole. <laughs> and just very directly, like, we made eye contact, and we've been friends ever since. That was it. Yeah, that's, that's, all, that, that's all that needs to be said it about was that. Done. I brought the loudness to the table that he sat at at that point. That was what I did. That's how I changed the behavior. And the weird thing about... Uh, about that is I think that would have worked with any dude from New Jersey. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think any oh, dude from New Jersey yeah. would, have, would have absolutely filled that no, role perfectly. Uh, see, I didn't know that I had just given him his stripes. You know, he had been in <laughs> Texas for like three years and he had been waiting for his stripes. Right. right. Somebody somebody has to notice. Right, exactly. It's it's That's the funny thing about, you know, people from New, people from New Jersey. We don't want uh anyone to try to change us we just simply want someone to recognize us for exactly what we are right yeah that's and it well, and since i've met you by the way i've been able to pick out anyone from new jersey i'll be with a crew of people somewhere like in georgia and they'll be like that dude's an asshole and i'm like that dude's not an asshole he's just from jersey that's man. right it's like, <laughs> like buying a new relax. car yeah, yeah you, you buy a new car you're like oh everybody's got this car now what's going on yeah so, no you get a friend from jersey you know every jersey person from so there on we're, out we're at the house of blues tattooing uh in houston texas and uh i'm, I'm tattooing a girl i met at another music festival and she's telling me about her life on the road and this and that you know and she, at one point, stops the conversation and goes, hey, I'm, I'm really sorry if I'm being an asshole tonight. And I looked at her and I said, I, I thought you were from New Jersey. <laughs> and she looks me dead in the eyes and goes, I am. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Guys, I hope that person is listening to this podcast at some point I, in the future. I'm, I'm going to love it when this podcast hits on the East Coast. And right. New Jersey just blows the shit up. Yeah, no. You New guys, Jersey. listen, Jersey, we, we fucking love you. Brick City, uh, Shaolin, <laughs> Jerusalem, we, we love all of that shit. Come on, come, come, come on down to East Texas. Come to Black yeah. Spot Tattoo. We yeah, will tattoo gonna, the fuck out of you. Yeah, well, you're going to fit in real well here. We got a little bit of Jersey vibe right here in East Texas. Yeah, we just a little bit, Just a little bit. Just a little bit. So, not, not enough but, to smell it. But the here. interesting no. point about all those stories is, you know... <sighs> So my kids were up there at one point after, pretty quick after that. You weren't married yet, Mike, uh, at Starbucks, but they used to hang out with us on the patio, and then sometimes we'd take it back to my house, you right. know, and, and, and my kids would be in the conversations then. They were very young, you know, they would have their own table generally, but they were, but they were hearing grown-up talk. Correct. And then that, that story that you told flavor ray about you know you know our daughters you know choking each other out but well your right. daughter choked my daughter out my daughter didn't fight back at that point too hard but she did survive yeah. that incident she did absolutely and they've and by the way his daughter and my daughter were best friends from that moment on yeah because are. specifically because his daughter said this is my new friend yeah and ben's like the one just tried to strangle you she's like yeah her yeah. And they were inseparable from that moment on. Yeah, and they've been separated, but they still talk about each other. And, and quite frankly, they're still friends. I yeah. mean, they're, they're still good friends, I think. No, they are. I mean, I haven't heard otherwise. They I'm, are psychically connected. Yeah, my 11-year-old would tell me now if, if, if she tells me everything. So she would tell me if she was not friends with Audrey. Um, but anyhow, the point of this is I think that's why tattooed with children. Yeah. But because because quite frankly, 
we we I don't see it as a different part of my life. Well, here's the thing. Everything that we've done, and we've done a lot of shit. Right. You know, I mean, we've we've we're we're, we're 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 ten years into adventures, and everything that we've done, we've done in full view of all of our children. Yes. I mean, if if there was a very late night concert uh, involving <laughs> thrash metal and you know alcohol, the kids were right. there. Yeah. If there was a uh, you know. Uh, uh, late night uh, or, uh, or, early, or early morning or mid-afternoon, something yeah, going on. The kids right. were always there. And so they've watched the party. They've watched the after party. They've watched the preparation. They've watched the, uh, the uh, struggle. They've, right. watched, they've watched us fight. Yeah. You know, I mean, they've watched us do all of those things. We didn't hide anything. Right. Like well, our they, parents hid from us. Yeah, and I don't know necessarily that our parents were, were attempting to hide it from us, but they did keep a certain amount of life in the background. Yeah, a certain a, a, what they would, what they would call it would would, would be a grown up distance. You know, if I if I was a kid and I tried to listen to the grown ups talk or have a grown up conversation with a grown up, I would be called quote mannish. The term right. mannish kept being popped up, where it's like you know you're trying to act like a man. And I didn't feel I was trying to act like a man at all. I felt like I was trying to act like me, but I was just really curious. Like, what are you guys talking about? Can I add to it? I, I think it's a really important point in, in, in the podcast that you guys, this seems to come naturally to you, um, or it has from my perspective come naturally to, um, to those in this group that I hang out with, you guys especially, the two of you, um, raising kids in a different scenario from what I grew up in, you uh -huh. know? Um, by necessity, I learned a lot of adult things, but I learned it through my siblings, okay. not through the the other adults. Now, how much how much gap is between you and your and your siblings? So, my older brother uh, is four years older, and he's the he's the closest elder sibling. Okay, right. So, I would say a pretty significant gap. Um, uh, certainly, I have one with a, a seven year gap uh, right. in in with my kids, but. Um, <clears throat> so I have a little anticipation of some of that learning happening in that way, but um, at the same time, uh, my my older sister, who really was one, you know, uh, one of the ones I learned a lot from, uh, just growing up and relied upon for that sort of thing, was, uh, was six years older than I am. Okay. So it, it's it's just interesting to see the difference, you know, in how we're doing things. Where, you, like you're saying, the parents are more open with what's going on, what's real life. To the yeah. kids and not trying to protect kids from what really happens out there. I think that might be the essence of 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 being tattooed with kids. Like if because you're you're tattooed, when when we started when I started getting tattoos, it was the idea that there's a scar on my arm that I can't see, so I'm going to make the scar visible. And Ben echoed that uh, that sentiment. You know, without being provoked, that was one of the things that like blew my mind. Was that he thought that way too? And when uh, and once it's on, once the tattoo is there, once it's out in the open, you know, there's there's no point in pretending that you didn't get hurt to get that tattoo. Right. You know, for a fact that you it was painful, and your child knows that you went through pain. Like I I remember the first time I saw my father uh, admit to pain. And it was in such an extreme circumstance yeah. that it's uh, it, it's uh, uh, mind-boggling that it would take that in order for him to show his son that he they could feel something. You yeah, know? I remember my dad. I, I think you know I learned I learned so so much from my mom and excuse me so much from my mom and dad. But I want to say I was seventeen or eighteen really before I understood that my parents were people. Right. And, may, and maybe that's natural, but I also think that 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 really and truly is something that that we attempted to show our kids much earlier. Yes. And 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 part of the reason for that again goes back to the fact that I I I feel like to some extent, even though all three of us would argue. And I have heard you both, and, and, and I feel like I've echoed this, is we all had great parents. 
Yeah. I, I like like there were problems, but like I I know both of your dads. Yeah. I, right. I like I <laughs> you know I I I know both of your moms. Like I you guys know my parents. Right. And, you, you, and your, your yet, parents are absolutely your, your mother's a saint. Yeah, my mother is and a saint. And your dad is a guru. And but but I think that even even with that we felt a little a little abandoned in, in in the sense that we were not prepared for the world we walked into at 18. The weird 17, thing, 19. Right. The weird thing about it to me, looking back at it, is I kept wondering what was going on behind the curtain. I kept wondering how the sausage was made and it wasn't being like you like my my mom would get up and go to work and then my dad would uh come in like he he worked shift work so he would come in at odd hours yeah and i would only know he was i remember this very specifically it would be very late at night and i would hear his keys hit the counter right and that's how i knew that he was home and it would i would always wake wake up and get up and just look and make sure it was him and then go back to go back to sleep. Right. And I never but I never knew like which one of them made more money. What were the how did the money uh you know was distributed? You know what what was the purpose of these odd hours on his part? You know where did, where was my mother going? Right. Was she was right. like what was her actual job? You know, I mean right. things those questions weren't were not clear to me until much later on in my life. Well, and, and what's strange, and I want to hear from you, Mike, too, but what's strange about that for me is even when my dad had a government job, he took me to work almost one day a week. Yeah. Oh, okay, so that, that was very unusual. I mean, me and my brothers were homeschooled. I'm the oldest of eight, and I would go to work with him one day a week. So, so I learned real quick how to get along in the office. I learned real quick what he did. Completely opposite experience from you. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned real quick how he did what he did, how he brought home money, what the stress of that was, but I still never really saw it cause him any discomfort. Like right. he handled it so well. Like I right. remember his boss coming in uh, one one day and yelling at him, and he him sending me into the other room. He had a government job, and his boss came in, stomped in the door, got past the secretary, you know, and chewed him out. Right. So the secretary put me to work filing some stuff, you know, and then it got busy, and they had a bunch of people come in. So then the secretary had to shoo me out. So then I end up in the hallway, you know, with all the people uh, waiting on, you know, food stamps. You right. know, in different things, uh -huh. and and but so, but even then, you know, my dad didn't come out of the office upset. He right. didn't come out of the office and go drink. He didn't come out of the office and like, man, I had a bad day. He came out of the office and asked me about my day, asked me how my schoolwork had gone, asked me, you know, and and that created a little bit of separation, unintended perhaps. Right. But I still hit eighteen not really quite sure how this all worked right right and and, and like how did, how did like you do Mike, that? What, what so what? so my my experience was was a tad different as i never um i never worried too hard about uh about income but i was aware that it uh it tended to be an issue um you know, sometimes not putting two or two and two together. Um, you know, big home expenses um, sometimes would go for a period of time without getting taken care of, without getting fixed. Yeah. Right. And some of those big home expenses, you know, can be really embarrassing in school or whatever. You know, but um, uh, clothing expenditures and and smaller things like that. You know, I never really worried about it. I was always more uh, my thing on it, and I think w what what colors me is when I got to be eighteen, I had certain expectations yeah. of what I was able to do. Okay, it was it was like it was drilled into me from a very young age that I was the one. I was I was the child who was expected to be successful um, right off the top. Okay, um, I was I was the magic kid. All okay. my sisters adored me. All all that you know. So yeah. So what happened was, um, 
what I had a lot of trouble with was interpersonal relationships at 18. Okay. It was now, very with, strange. With, with, just, with just anyone or with like... With, with anyone. Okay. All of my friends were at least four years older than I was. And the vast majority of them were 10 or more years older than I was. Imagine an 18-year-old being friends with a 28-year-old. Okay. That's, right, that's yeah. kind of tough, right? Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, um, you know, uh, personal relationships, you know, uh, girlfriends, things like that was, was really difficult on me. And, and I had um, the, the, the net effect of stuffing down worries over everything else and not focusing on it was that it builds up an anxiety. Right. And so that's something I've struggled with my entire life is a, a, an anxiety when it comes to social situations. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, it's, it, it is one of those things where I don't know if it's, if it's just our generation. It's not just our generation. I know it's not just our generation. But I don't know if it's a hallmark of our generation that our parents were trying to protect us a lot of the time. For example, my dad is a Vietnam vet. And he's never, it's only recently that he's been able to tell me anything about what happened in Vietnam. I grew, when I was a kid, I always thought that he must have been, because uh, he was in the Navy, I was like, well, he didn't see any, any real combat, he was in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true at all. Uh, my dad was a straight up island hopper. He was the, uh, basically the pre-training for the SEALs, that it should become the SEALs. Like, they were used him in an experiment because he was such an asshole that they didn't like him, so they were trying to get him killed. And uh, he carried a BAR, Brian Automatic Rifle, uh, fighting uh, communists in, their, in, in, in the jungle for, like, three or four tours. I mean, some ridiculous amount of tours. And he kept writing letters home to his mother saying he's about to die tomorrow is one sending you this letter. He wrote that letter, like, 12 times. So it made sense later on why he made some decisions that he made. It made, like that, like once I had that bit of information, I was able to make more sense of my life. Yeah. You know? Right. And, I was like, if, and I was like, if you had told me this years ago, I don't know, like things would be a lot different right now. I would not have been as confused. Right. It would have explained some things for you. And again, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to give the impression on any of our uh, sides that, that that we have some disconnect from our, from our parents. I mean, no, I, my parents I think, are, are are great people. Ben's parents are great people, and we're very close to all of our yeah, parents. Yeah, I mean, I I love it when Mike's dad comes down, like you know, and and I mean that it's been one of it's been some of the best conversations I've ever had. But it, but I do think we because of it we we all three have a very large interest. But because of our different stories that'll come out in different ways at different times in showing our kids what life is like and that it is hard and that they're gonna face uh, they're gonna face struggles and to an extent we can't help them with, with our experience can only show them that we're having experiences right our experience can't cannot educate them on how to deal with what they're going to deal with right. at 18, 19, 20. It's not direct instruction. It's just sh saying, like, you know, this is, this is going to happen. Yeah, you, you, I, I've been more honest with my kids about, uh, for instance, changing jobs. Right. I, I've been more honest with my kids about debt. I started talking to my daughter about, you know, building a credit score at the age of 16. Right, but but you, you know, and things of that nature, and 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 then also trying to help them, which I think all of our parents did in a way, but trying to help the, uh, trying to encourage them in avenues of their interest, and when they come back and say things like, "Well, Dad, I'm not sure I want to do this for the rest of my life," being able to say, "Well, you don't have to," right, but you have to do something right now. Right, right. You, 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 you know, this 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, this is very important. You, you don't have to do this forever, but you have to do something. Right. So if you're not going to go to college, what are you going to do? Right. If you're not going to start a business, what are you going to do? If you're not going to get married, if you're not going to, you know, 
what do you, what do you want to do? Because you have to do something. And straight up, I do that with I've been doing that with my nine year old since she was six. I mean, like it was just a rule for her that that listen, you're going to have to take a physical education course of some sort. Right. You're going to have to take a uh, a, a musical instrument. Right. And you're going to have to do some sort of hobby. Like, I don't care what it is. And so she picked martial arts, piano, and drawing. Yeah. And she is ridiculously excellent at, at all three. And now she's starting a business. And now she wants to do, you know, other things. Now she's doing stop motion animation. Right. And she has so many passions that she is free to pursue that going back in my mind, I'm like, like I had passions too, but I wasn't free to pursue them. Or you felt not, perhaps not able I, to communicate. Yeah, I couldn't really communicate what I needed. Like that, you said, that's because what's been, that's, yeah. that's been coming out in my Instagram lately. Some of my Instagram posts have have really been highlighting that I don't know that it's necessarily what my parents were focused on, as much as that I didn't necessarily feel like I had the skills to communicate to them what I was experiencing. I mean, right. that translates so, so much into adult life because I, I'm, 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 I'm building an entire business around that exact concept in adults. You, you've got a lot of people out there, I know it, I've seen it, who every day have difficulty communicating their struggles. Right. You know, personal, professional, however, whatever. And, and w- what I've always been interested in is understanding people's struggles. Yes. And that has translated into me just talking to people and right. saying, what are you struggling with? What are you dealing with? And it translates into my kids. You know, I, I, I've, I've asked my 15-year-old that, that direct question. I haven't been as good with the 15-year-old as encouraging all these things that she needs to do or that she should try right. at least once. And her mother's been much better at that than I have. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But what it boiled down to is we actually ended up having a conversation a couple of months back. And I was like, well, the, the question I asked is, when you have nothing else to do, what is it that you choose to do? Yeah. And the answer to that question is really what she wants to do. And I said, and how do you plan on making a living doing that someday? It starts a whole entire conversation. Yeah. Right. You know, I think the communication of our struggles, the communication of our passions, our life is something that, you know, when, when you take on, you, you don't put things permanently on your body, especially things in full sight of the public that people may or may not find controversial without, <clears throat> excuse me, recognizing that struggle of, of being able to communicate what you need right. and be able to translate that back to your kids and that's why I think it's so important. Even putting yeah. tattoo on is that is that struggle in communication. Yeah, and, and that and that brings us kind of kind of around so I guess we started it backwards. It's called tattooed with children, but we it started is. with the children and now we've worked our way back to the tattoos. Um, I I got tattooed first, I, I believe in nineteen ninety eight. Uh, my wife could probably tell me better the numbers. It might have been ninety nine but um, I got my first tattoo then, and I and I was pretty hooked. Uh, I was pretty hooked right away. I think it might have been a year or two afterwards that I got my next one, um, and then um, I let's see. After that, I think I went every single year for almost ten years, um, getting okay. a tattoo. And, and and after that, it was uh, it was a little less. I got my first tattoo at Gypsy Blue. I got my second tattoo at, uh, let's see. I think I got my second tattoo at Gypsy Blue too. And then my third tattoo, what's that place on the way into Nacogdoches uh, that was on the right? Tattoo Magic? Yeah, Tattoo Magic. Okay, the redheaded twins were there then. And, yeah. and if you're in tattoo culture at all in East Texas, you're gonna know who I'm talking about. Um, they were super famous because they were like tattooing when they were 14 or some shit. Um, but anyway, I, I stayed there. I think Pat Casey was an apprentice not long after that. Okay. Pat Casey went on and, and it, oddly enough, I never got a tattoo from him. 
um, at Tattoo Magic, to my knowledge. He he might be able to correct me. It'd be nice to have him on one day. And but that'd be great. Uh, I got I got tattooed at Tattoo Magic by Aaron and Melissa Dixon for for many years, and, and you know, more you know two or three, and then which is a long time in tattoo world. And uh, and then by that time, Pat Casey had 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 done his time and was opening up Casey's Tattoo in Nacogdoches, which is one of the premier, quite frankly, most underrated shops in Texas. It's in my opinion. It's probably the best shop that you can find in between Dallas and Houston. I, I absolutely agree with that, but like I, but I would I would put those guys up against anyone. Yes. In Dallas or Houston. Yes, they're they're definitely competitive with everybody that you've seen on Tattoo Masters yeah. or any of that other stuff. Yeah, you're, you're they're just great artists, and they're and the thing about it is they love to do the art on people, and that's not that's something you can find in every tattoo artist. Yeah, and I'm gonna just shout them out real quick. The, you're you're talking about Caleb Dew, uh, Krista Robertson. Uh, Marco Gomez and and Rob Zilstra. I don't know if if Brandon or uh, if either of them are still there. Uh, Brandon or Brent is still there. All those guys. Uh, Rob's the most recent one to join, but I've seen his work grow head and shoulders. Marco is the most natural machine artist I've seen in a long time. And I couldn't say enough. Uh, Both Caleb and Krista have tattooed me. I recommend them to people all the time because as, as far as, you know, traditional machine artists go, I, I'm, I'm still going to put them up against anybody I've ever seen or ever met. Caleb Dew and Krista have tattooed me as well, and they are fantastic. Uh, Caleb actually did my first one. Okay. It was a... It was a um, how about how long ago? What? It was... I got my first tattoo. It was after I, I moved back, so this would have been... 2011, okay. I want to say. All right. Uh, and uh, when I when I met like Ben had had Ben had tattoos when I met him, obviously, but he didn't have that many. Like it, it like he didn't see like now, if you see him like any place that's not covered by a shirt has a tattoo on it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but. Uh, back then, he had he had a lot he had a lot more space, and so I was like, you know, well, who do you recommend to do this? And he was he was like, said, you know, for the guys, this is Aaron and Melissa. But Aaron and Melissa moved away, and said, I really think you ought to look at this guy Caleb Do. Well, uh, I didn't. Uh, I was the thing about tattoos and me is I like to match the tattoo with the artist. All right, so I wasn't gonna just get my first tattoo from just anybody. I needed to to know that the guy was great. And so I started following him either on Facebook Probably. or it, was, it must have been Facebook. And I started looking at his art and I was like, man, this guy's really good. And so one day out of the blue, he goes, hey, I want to do a sleeve on somebody, uh, but you don't get to pick the artwork. I'm just, I'm just going uh, I'm I'm just, I'm just to tattoo you and you, you don't get to pick it and it's, and it's free. And 30 people immediately like three seconds said i want to do it i want to do it i want to do it i was one of those 30. Wow. Like, yeah i want to do it i want to do it i want to do it and i think two days later i drove to nacogdoches and just ran up in casey's tattoo yeah. first time yeah and it was like hey caleb uh i'm one of the guy i'm i'm, I'm, the, I'm the guy that said i wanted you to, to do that sleeve on me like you know what, what, what do you think yeah he said yeah sit down all right, all right. i was like why did you and so he started working on it. He said, it's, it's, it's free, huh? I said, yeah, it's free. I said, why are you doing this? He says, well, it's something I want to do. I said, well, why me? He said, of any of the other guys that were, he said, uh, you're the only one that showed up. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. And so, and so uh, and, I said. And that's, I want you to know, that's freaking nuts at his skill level. It's crazy. Like that dude, that dude literally tattooed my neck in like an hour and 15 minutes. Put the put the most badass crow. Uh, that crow I, is famous. Yeah, I mean, like, well, according to the old ladies in Lufkin, it's my necktie. Uh, right. Apparently, they can't see the head of the crow, so it looks like I'm wearing a necktie. Whenever, whenever he wears a collared shirt, it does look like he's. Yeah, no, and it's just like, like I got, old crow medicine show. Man, I got my freaking neck tattooed so people would stop talking to me, and now I get all these old women in Walmart like, I love your neck tattoo. See, here's <laughs> see, th- this this is a very good point you just brought up. 
Ben, he when when Ben gets a notorious uh, tattoo or notorious action, something that people can pay attention to, he gets famous. His kids get you know his kids, his kids get famous. Like hey, that guy that did the thing. If I do some shit like that, I don't get famous. I get infamous. It's like, oh, you got that fucked up thing that you did, did on. The, say, I think it's because I think I think it's a race thing. I think man, it's a race thing, not, man. We are not going into race on the second. Here's what I'm going to tell you. It, it, we're, it, we're we're not okay. We're going into let's race. Let's make a I, note of it. I, I we're making note of it. We're, 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 we're yeah. We'll we'll, 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 put, we'll put we'll put a pin on it. But the yeah. but the point the point I was I was I was I was making was that's the reason why I didn't get a neck tattoo. Yeah. No. That's straight up. And I will say this. It it took me a long time to figure this out, but I run good. I, like, yeah. like like I run ridiculously well. I mean, we're we're gonna we're gonna get into our life stories another night, but uh, or another day, hopefully. But but the point is, right. I run really good. I, I mean, I I run good at life. I run good at business. I run good at at the tables. Uh, I I just I and 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 so it's really weird because like. For instance, I have my right hand tattooed red because of, of, uh, of a song by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds called Red Right Hand. And it's a song about some kind of mafia or it's like secret. It's a creepy secretive... fucking song. It is a creepy fucking song, but it's fantastic. So I got my, re- my right hand tattooed red. My whole right hand is tattooed red because of that song because it's an amazing song. If you haven't heard it, look up Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, Red Right Hand. And but 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 the point of that is, I thought seriously that that would help me stop being approached in public. It didn't and work. And literally, all it has done is made more people talk to me. They're like, "Oh, hey, I see you got the your red right hand tattooed. Uh, what what's going on there? What'd you do? What'd you do that for?" If I, I got my red, red right hand much. tattooed, I would have absolutely been arrested. I think you smile too much. Are you seriously gonna say that? Yeah, like, I do not smile that much. Do you I? smile all the time. All the damn you time. You smile, particularly if it's you a female. You are way too approachable. <laughs> and that's look. And I'll, I'll I'll put I'll put that down right now. I'll videotape your ass. If a, if, if Ben is doing nothing and a woman comes and says, "Hey, how you doing?" and that's the the big baby blue shine. Okay, he's, okay, he's, look, he's, uh, look, like you can't see on. me, but I went I went and got this forearm tattoo. It's my first tattoo that is this shows no matter what I'm wearing. Okay, in most yeah, cases, we right? we overlooked the kid from Jersey. When- so I uh, I'll get to the first one. I'll tell you this: I, the first day after I get this tattoo, I have to go drop uh, my son off and pick him up from uh, the church camp. During the summer, I was really hoping you were going to say prison, since you're from New Jersey. I, I thought maybe you just dropped your kids off at prison. Just the, 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 the that's, best. That's, it's good. They as have any the equipment. Care. They have the equipment to handle that situation. <laughs> as good so as any daycare. Um, so I, I'm this church that they're having the church camp at is a church that I, I used to attend. I know a lot of the people there. Uh, I know who they are, but I don't talk to anyone because it's just okay. not who I am. Sure. And so they they generally. Um, refer to me as uh, uh, that's that's uh, that's Cohen's dad or that's Liz's husband. That's that's how I'm referred to. Okay. Right. They don't right. know who I am. They don't care. Right. So I walk up to this church um, uh, first time holding uh, holding Cohen's hand across the street, and then second time uh, as I'm coming out, I've got my you guys can't see me. But I got my arms folded across my chest as I'm walking. Right. Tattoo full on display, and the looks that I would get from people. Yeah, just but, fantastic. This this wonderful mix of curiosity and wanting to approach. Right. But I put such a scowl on my face because I had just listened to twenty five college age students <laughs> jumping, dancing, and screaming Christian songs at nine right. o'clock in the morning. It was highly inappropriate for my ears. Um, that I ha- must have had the worst scowl on my face, and right. no one wanted to talk to me. Okay, I'm going to jump in real quick. Uh, Mike's not saying that Christian songs are inappropriate. He's just saying that anything that happens at 9 o'clock in the morning is inappropriate. Anything at that particular decibel level (laughs) and that many voices at 9 o'clock in the morning was inappropriate. Look, loud teenage, 25 teenagers yelling at you about Christ at 9 o'clock in the morning, that's going to put anybody off. I I mean, that's just a fact. Okay, continue the story. So my first tattoo, um, I'll I'll, I'll jump into that now. My first tattoo... uh, uh, I got it in 2002. It'd be the summer of 2002. Uh, I got it because I needed to do something 
because I turned 18 and I had to be awesome and I was already smoking. So right. um, obviously tattoo was the next step. Okay. You got um, nothing left. <clears throat> so I got a, um, uh, I'm a big Metallica fan. I always have been and I always will be. Um, and so I got a small banner on my arm what I, that I could afford that night um, that says, don't tread on me. And um, that has that has worked very well to my benefit in the South, by the way. I just want you guys to know that. Yeah. No, that's um, one of the, that's definitely one of the things that I help you out in the South. So, and then uh, uh, I actually had a long hiatus, uh, got no tattoos um, uh, until, uh, until Ben here tattooed my other arm. Um, what was it? In 2000? It was uh, right, we right moved, when we opened this. Yeah, no, it was the first night we opened. Uh, that would have been 2017. 2017. We opened, we opened this location. Yeah, yeah so this, yeah. I went 15 years uh, okay. from first tattoo to second tattoo. Can I? Can we go down a rabbit hole real quick? Uh, Sure. I carry the club like Neanderthal, the quiet guy. Everybody dancing, dog. Y'all on that X, I'm a sentinel. Standing tall, no time to stand still. Please don't meander, dog. They're throwing jazz at me. To challenge my rap savvy, I sway like Callaway. I'm a head, you'll never catch me. And worry about it unless I spit Christmas gifts. My crew lighting up three to a screw. So, he. I, I, I just want to jump back to this uh, because I have a I have a, a really super love hate relationship with Metallica. Okay, this this is this is going to get good right now. I love okay. this. Okay, so here's my thing. Okay, so I was not allowed to listen to music as a kid. Uh, okay, we we were we were homeschooled and very conservative, and so we we weren't. Uh, well, I didn't really grow up with the radio. And we didn't we didn't have a TV in our house. Wait, just just a moment. So, like I like I know you were you were involved in uh, uh, a pretty intense religious uh, you know re- religion uh, yeah. sect. Yeah. So, but your parents were like they didn't allow the the music in the house. Well, the 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 so we were homeschooled under this curriculum that was a part of ATIA or the Advanced Training Institute of America or IBLP, Institute of Basic Life Principles, under... Uh, Goddard, right? Uh, this guy named Bill Gothard, and uh, he's since been found out. But it's the same, it's the same uh, homeschooling thing that the Duggars use, right. you know, and, and that, they, that they practice. So my parents, when they, they were trying to protect us, and, and, and the, the homeschooling literature said that if you let your kids listen to the Beatles, for instance, that, okay. the, that the devil will get them. Right, okay. So, I mean, and that's, that's broad. But, right, yeah, yeah. But because of that, we did not have radio. And, okay. And we did not have television. So there was no television in the house. And, and we did not turn the radio on when we went somewhere. Okay. Like, we, we just rolled the windows down and, like, talked and stuff. And, and and like we sang, you know, like yeah, like, as, as I was saying, like Jesus songs. See, that's what know? threw me off, guys, because I know his family, and they are so musical. Like they're one of the most musical yeah, families no, I've ever seen. No, we are. I mean, I mean, my 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 parents are both very musical, and and have led music and done music. So so yeah, we did hymns and stuff, and like played instruments. My mom taught us all piano, right? And she's a very talented piano player herself. And then, and then my dad and her like wrote some songs together and like performed songs that other people wrote. Right. You know, because they they grew up in you know the era of of, uh, of some of the greatest musicians out there. But but my point is, so I didn't grow up with any of this. You didn't grow up in. You didn't grow up listening to the you know latest top twenty or. No, so like when I was 17 years old, I would take an extension cord and pull the radio as far as the extension cord would get away from the house. Okay. And turn the oldie station on. Okay. So I was 17 when I heard Brown Eyed Girl for the first time, and I thought it was extremely indecent. <laughs> we're, we're talking about Van Morrison. When, when, he, when, 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 when he first heard Brown Eyed Girl, I was doing things. Right. Things with the Brown Eyed Girl. Right. Okay, and, was, that's, and that's he fine. He was listening to a radio 20 feet from his house, <laughs> popping a chubby, listening I to was, Brown Eyed Girl. No, <laughs> no, I was very concerned about the nation when I heard that song. Oh, my God. Seriously, I understood why I had been cautioned against... This Such is certainly the devil. Because clearly, <laughs> it led to clearly, of your it brain. led to the devil. But wow. 
so it took me it took me a few years to get into like pop and rock and roll, right? Right. Well, you don't go straight from pop and, and rock and roll to you know Metallica. So like, yeah. Right. Right. You you just don't. So it was it was a, you know it was probably I was probably in my mid twenties. Okay. I, w- I would say 25, 26. This is fucking fascinating, guys. If you know Bill, I can know, but you like 25? Seriously? It don't, he got here in 15 years. I, I kept hearing about this inner Sandman. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking like, okay, so the king of dreams inside you. Like I'm very con- <laughs> like I-N-N-E-R. You know, like what? Wow. <laughs> Okay, so we need Owen Wilson on the soundboard. Okay, wow. oh my so God, that is so, so great. <laughs> that Mike, is so Mike, great. Mike, your wow, wow is really if if Ray's motherfucker rivals Samuel L. Jackson's, your wow is seriously like Royal Tenenbaum, like way up in this pitch. <laughs> it's, it's it's pretty good. Okay, so so yeah, so I found Metallica late. Yeah. O- o- okay, and I wasn't. I'm trying to, I'm so trying to like I fix went, in my head how far he came from the, the age of 25 yeah, no, to the I age understand. of 35. I'm, I'm, I'm just sitting there going like, I want to see the look on his face the first time he actually hears this song, this, this yeah, inner I mean, Sandman. Yeah, it was, <laughs> well, it, I mean, quite frankly, I'm still confused why that song doesn't get listed in the top 10 of greatest rock songs of all time. It does. You're it just really, not it looking really at the right be. ones. It really should. Okay. It really well, should that's be. fair. But see, I went more. But, but I don't think you it's gotta, in the top ten. You you got to no, remember. You you got to remember though that Metallica fans are like Metallica fans, and, right? And like fuck Pearl Jam, right? Like yeah, Metallica but, fans yeah, yeah. are like Metallica fans, but they're like fuck Nirvana. Like Metallica Dude, fans are Metallica fans. Like fuck fuck Nor- uh, Metallica. They're I mean, yeah, they're right, no, no, straight up. But but so they're like yo, you're listening. You're listening to the Black Album. I mean, that's like pop Metallica. You need to be listening yeah, to. That's, you gotta be listening to fucking. You, you need to be um, listening Master to Ride the Lightning, okay. Master of Puppets. Okay, sure, but but here's the thing. I went more than Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Seven Mary Three. Like I, I, I you know, alternative radio on K Fox ninety five, circa nineteen ninety eight. Right. Okay. Oh man, I yeah, got shivers. It was, yeah, no, it was rough. I mean, they they only played it from like eleven twenty to eleven forty. It was late, and and then you didn't know if the guy died or he, if he OD'd. Like sometimes it would just be like blank air, you know, right. like it just like forty minutes of music and then it's gone. So my point is this: so I I, I had a an, an admiration and a respect for Metallica. Okay, I was impressed by what they did. Okay, but. But I, but I have a respect and an admiration for almost all genres of music. And I would argue that, quite frankly, I'm going to be real with y'all here. Today, as I sit here as a 40-year-old, sure. I think Metallica is its own genre. And I don't think anyone's ever gotten close. So I, okay. I, I want to preface this statement by saying I, I actually believe that. Okay. I believe Metallica is its own genre. You want to listen to bluegrass? Fine. You want to listen to hip-hop? Fine. You want to listen to Dirty South? Fine. You want to listen to pop? Fine. You want to listen to Metallica? Fine. Okay? Okay. But then something happened. What happened, Ben? Some moron created Napster. Ah, By the Napster. Way, this shouldn't surprise you to learn. Okay, so He's yeah, I know exactly what happened here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know where this story's going. The guy who created Napster. And, and it's literally Napster, from New Jersey. Napster gave me access to every band in the history of the world that I had never heard of, that I was trying to slowly buy their CDs one by one, but I realized right. I was never going to be able to. Right. Because I didn't have enough money. So I was like, literally, like I'm buying fucking like the Dixie Chicks album. All of this is starting you know what to make I'm saying? sense now. Like, I'm buying the Dixie Chicks. Yeah. I'm buying, uh, dude, I'm, I'm buying John Legend. I'm buying, uh, dude, I bought everything. Right. I, I bought The Chronic, 2001. I, 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 bought, I bought Dre. I bought everything. Right. I bought movie soundtracks, okay? I bought all kinds of music. He's I would buy kinds of music. Time. Right. And then Napster comes along. And suddenly, I have access to all of all the music. All the music. I can listen to what Denmark's making. I can listen to what Australia's making. Yeah. I can learn about bands I've never heard of. And then this motherfucker named Lars 
decides that he's going to make wage a one man war against the internet yeah and then he won and then he won and i didn't have music anymore yep yep i i knew that was where the story's going to end up to uh, be fair it's not just the metallica fandom that doesn't like lars ulrich it's yeah. also the members of the band. <laughs> <laughs> Lars Ulrich is he had the biggest fall from grace I've ever seen before the Me Too era. Well, the like, problem, was, Ray, was that it should have come a long time before it did, right? <laughs> if you listen to anything Metallica ever did live, right? the man can't keep time. <laughs> <laughs> that okay, is true. Look, uh, he has a harder look, he has he, he has a harder time he, playing drums than than uh uh Hatfield does, you know, playing the guitar for sure. Right. You, ca- you do kind of wonder where they would have been if they'd had Travis Barker. If they'd had <laughs> Travis Barker, if they'd had, if they'd had Travis Barker, they probably would have outshone the Beatles. They probably wouldn't be talking about the Beatles anymore. But still, I'm still here arguing that even though I hate that dude, right? That, well, I hate's a strong word. I dislike him strongly. We don't hate anybody. If I saw him publicly, I would probably say some unkind things, but smile while I did it. If I, if I saw Lars Ulrich, I would be like, brother, I feel your pain. I know that was a hard decision. Well, and, and, and it's it weird to be because, a hard because, because the other guy, what's his name? Ja- James? James Hetfield. Hetfield. He yeah. went on Joe Rogan last week. Okay. And it was an incredible interview. I learned so many things I didn't know, which I always do when I listen to Joe Rogan. Right. Yeah, contrary I, to popular opinion, Hetfield is actually extraordinarily eloquent and intelligent. Yeah, I don't. He he's he's always been that way. Like from my experience, I mean, I I always listen to the guy talk. They lumped him in with they lumped him in with Ulrich during the whole Napster thing, I, and see, everyone treated him like a gorilla. And, and, and it, but it was interesting because he talks about that, and and now ten years later, I mean, I understand they won, right? Right. Sure. You can call that winning. But but did they win? I mean, I feel like they won the battle, but they lost the war. No. It 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 it. It put their momentum if, at a if, standstill. If, if what they were, if their goal was to make more money from their music, then they didn't actually win. I don't. But see here. But 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 I'm gonna play the devil's advocate. Sure. I don't. Was that Lars's goal? I'm not I sure he, what Lars's goal was. I, I think, think he, he just hated people were were downloading the music for free. For free. He just hated it. He just hated it like in his soul. Okay, but he ended up being right. Yes. Because I know a lot of musicians. And quite frankly, Jay-Z gets a lot of hate for having his own uh, streaming service, Mm -hmm. Tidal. Right. And I tried to talk people into Tidal for a year. I actually bought like a two-year membership of Tidal the day it came out. People have been railing on Tool for the last four or five years because up until just, what, this last month, they, they haven't licensed their music to be streamed at all. Who? Tool. <laughs> yeah. Way. Tool. Yeah. <laughs> like, if, like, honestly, I, I wish we, we have got a live tweet this at some point, Ray. <laughs> For sure. You, the, 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 the Tool fans are going to come out of the woodwork. Oh, they are, they are Dude, amazing they're and rabid. loud. <laughs> any, okay. In any, any, anybody, anybody, any musician that in the effort to protect their art, keeps their art off of streaming services right is they're not doing it wrong they're not doing it at all like right. you're you're actually not even well uh, you're not you're not playing the game you're, 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 you're not, you're not you're playing the game you're, you're, you're not in the industry right. right all right point blank and period if you're not on a streaming service because this is 2019 and it's too fucking late for you to protect your music digitally if you haven't already done it i think the problem is the problem with 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 the Metallica reaction to Napster was never that Lars uh, or any of the band members were actually wrong. It no. was how they reacted to their fan base clamoring for more from them. Yes. That was the huge argument was, we want to see more from you. Right. We want more from you. This gives us a way to get more from you without having to drain our, our accounts. Right. This is a prime example of the thing that was the struggle back then, which is exactly what you pointed out in the beginning, was an over-monetization of your base. Yeah. You know, from a business standpoint, it's what it boiled down to. And the fact that they reacted to it by shutting down their fans and saying, well, not just 
not just saying your music can't be downloaded and shutting down Napster and turning off that outlet, but they also, in retribution for the fact that, this is why I said that guy was from New Jersey who wrote right, Napster. Right, right, right. They would not play concerts in New Jersey for more than a year. Yeah. This is one of the right. largest areas for venues in the United States, right. and they right. would not play. Well, and again, I mean, that's, and that's crazy. It, 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 again, it goes back to the argument of what is art. It goes back to the, the, the argument of how do you make art. And I know we're going to get there because well, we're, we're all are, artists. Here, here's, but, the, here's, the thing about, here's the thing about DMC. Like, if you're going to put out something, if it's going to be a book, a movie, or a song, you're going to put it out, and you, it is good, then the people who bought it, have a certain ownership of your success. Not a lot. You did your own thing, but their experience with it is the reason why that you're successful. So you can't fight those people. Well, that's, If you fight them, you're but, fighting yourself. Right, but that's why I'm going to go back to my just insatiable love for hip-hop. Right. Because for all the negative things you can say about it, these men and women were out on the street corner spitting truth expecting nothing in return. They right. were not selling out stadiums. They were not playing for $5. There were no clubs to go hear them in. Right. Before 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 Ice Cube, before Dre, there was no way to make money doing it. The okay? first act to put to put rap on MTV was Blondie. Right. No, a hundred percent. So, so, so these guys, but these guys literally, they made a career out of artwork done on the street corner. Right. They made a career out of artwork done in a garage, a parking garage. You know, they, right. they, yeah, yeah, they, they were not. And so, and so that it's a completely different thing, but I don't know to, to, we, 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 we've got to, we got to, we got to segue back to the point at, at some point here, but We'll we'll get into more music culture later. I just wanted to throw out there that well, it was fuck that, that Lars. was that, that was that was a is perfect. That, is that still a hashtag? Fuck Lars. It should be, <laughs> and it, I can sure, bring it back in a hurry. I'm sure as soon as you as soon as you hashtag it, you'll get at least a hundred retweets. <laughs> at least a hundred going. I would have to get yeah, started. Fuck that guy. <laughs> I would have to start a Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I felt a little bad for we, him listening to we Joe Rogan. Take part of the social media responsibility here. So okay. I will absolutely send that. out a tweet that says fuck Lars on because I don't give a fuck. Well, Make sure you put our podcast in there as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, it'll, yeah, right. it'll, it'll be there. And if he wants to come on and explain his point of view, I'd be more than happy to talk to him. Absolutely. <laughs> Anytime. He, he's, he, if, when, he, when he comes on here, I'll be the most... He'll be like, I, were you the guy that said fuck Lars? And no, it wasn't me, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was that guy over there. The, 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 he's going to be like, but I have a screenshot here of uh, Black Crow Brother. That ain't me. Uh, uh, <laughs> take a picture of you while you posted it. <laughs> that, that that wasn't me, man. You can believe me. You can believe me or your line us. All right. So listen, we we've gone we've gone round. I think I think you're you're kind of starting to get the picture. We're going to talk about tattoos. We're going to talk about children. We're going to talk about parenting. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of other things, and we're probably going to swear a lot. Here's the thing. Oh yeah. We do want to hear from you. Uh, I know this is only the second podcast, so currently we have 14 listeners. Uh, I think two of those are me. But but my point being is we do want to hear from you. We do want to have you on the show. We're going to talk about a crazy amount of subjects. We're really nothing is off limits here. Yes, this is tattooed with children. We will have non-tattooed people on here. We, we will have yeah. tattooed parents and non-tattooed parents. Uh, we will have parents of all backgrounds, all walks of life. We will have humans of all walks of life. I, I suspect that very shortly we will have people without kids here. Yeah, I think, uh, like, I think that's I, one of the first things uh, that that'll actually happen to be somebody without any kids at all. I, I think it's I think it's fantastic. Unlike unlike some of the the opinions I've seen out there recently in the world, I've, I've gotten some actually had some friends up in the Northeast who have gotten mad because uh, they don't have kids, and apparently their opinion on kids don't matter. And I completely disagree with that statement. I I absolutely honestly believe that some of the most important opinions come from the people who don't actually have any kids. Right, and we're going to continue... We're going to get into that. We're going to continue giving you a voice even though you're wrong, Mike. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I absolutely... <laughs> guys, here, here's, 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 uh, here, here, here's, what, here's what Flavor Ray wants. Flavor Ray wants you guys to hit up our uh, messaging on... Uh, like, hit messages on, on uh, IG and Facebook about things that you want to, want to talk about, questions that you have. Not questions necessarily about us, but those are in fact uh, are, are relevant too. But if you have questions about 
the parody tattoos universe food i'll handle all the food related questions because i can do that yeah okay so flavor ray is going to handle all the food related questions uh mike mike is cio Payne or mike Payne is going to handle all the it questions and probably most of the business development questions and I'm going to handle everything else. I, I don't know what that is, but... Uh, he will not handle everything else. He can't handle it. question that. garbage can over here has he, been... He, he, can, he can't stand under that weight. No, he'll, I'm, no, he'll I'm not going to... Oh, he'll, 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 also... He'll, he'll definitely hit you with more bullshit than I will, though. If you want to get roasted by Flavor Ray, just make sure you, by you the, hit him up. He'll handle the roasting on So if, 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 we're, if, we're, if we're going to talk about... Listen, just my personality, guys. Okay, yes, I'm going to curse a lot. Uh, I run hot in general... I get very upset about things that go on in the world. Like I haven't, I haven't uh, pulled out really uh, any of the news. I get hype at the news, and so uh, if you're looking, the the dude that's going to be talking about all all the crazy shit that bothers you, uh, be you uh, liberal or conservative, libertarians. Uh, I I agree with a lot of what you say and disagree with a lot of what you say, and I'm going to hit you on both sides. That's just how I am. You know, so uh, look forward to that. Uh, look forward to, to the N-word coming out at some point. Sure, Which word is sure. he talking about? He's talking we're, about we're the gonna, word Naruto. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to have a conversation. We're Well, but that's the thing, man. Being tattooed, you just have a different set of standards. And we're going we're gonna to talk, talk about all kind of words that are off limits with your kids. Because everybody has a different take on it. And I don't think necessarily that we totally, as good parents, because that's what we want to be. Indeed. We, it, but, but I don't think we can totally say we love the way we're, we're, we're necessarily. I, I probably show too much to my kids. But uh, we're, we're also going to talk to some parents whose kids sing the shit song. I, I, I certainly, I certainly gonna, hope you know, that we're not coming off as, as being three guys saying that we know what we're doing or we know the best way. Clearly, I don't I'm, think we believe that. Clearly, I am the most confident motherfucker on the planet at having no clue what's actually happening right now. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm completely without uh, uh, a light in the dark as far as the world is concerned, and I don't know if I'm raising my daughter correctly. Right. You know, Mike, but I'm hoping. And, and, and Mike is just from Jersey, so we're not and even going to let him have this There fight. is nothing I do correctly. <laughs> not one thing. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, I think that's it for episode two. We're going to sign off now. If you've heard the dogs in the background, we do, in fact, have uh, three rescues. Uh, they're for sale. Uh, just contact Black Spot Tattoo Company and ask about the dogs. Uh, All right. Uh, what? I got a, uh, an IG that is Madara Shadow. I got a Twitter that is Hunter Vanguard. Uh, the, the, uh, for the podcast, the uh, Twitter is at Tattooed With because they wouldn't put on the children on the at because Twitter I already told you that Jack is an asshole I, I he just wait, a minute, wait a minute wait a minute wait wait a minute we're at tattooed with at yes tattooed we're with. at tattooed with with what anything you want with what the, the rest of it is up, up, with up to penises. so, so we Jack could literally, we could literally be at tattooed with children or at tattooed with Nazis yes we could if you go just by our at the, the name at tattooed with children is the name yeah but the at is at tattooed yeah. with at and tattooed with finish it yourself is what jack told me and you're like fuck you jack that's the stupidest thing i've ever heard well all right twitter. so in our third episode we're going to be talking about fucking twitter <laughs> mike where are you at on social get media going. you got hit me up on uh, ig at uh, uh, at cio pain um, linkedin.com uh, M-E-P-J-R or um, uh, on Facebook also CIO Pain. Alright, perfect. I'm at Black Spot Tattoo Company or Black Crow Brother. Uh, if you message me when I'm tattooing or asleep, I will not respond. So good luck. Those were Both of those were, were Instagram. Instagram Black Crow Brother and Black Spot Tattoo Company. Yeah, sure. That's what I said. Can we, go, <laughs> can, can we smoke? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Right, that, 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 that's it, guys. Love you. <laughs> <laughs>